Mushroom Wonderland. I'm Lowell Dietz. Uh, I am a lifetime member of the Kitsap Peninsula Mycological Society. I've been involved in that club for over 30 years. When I first started hunting mushrooms, I was amazed to find these flavors that I had never tasted before. And one of the old timers said, oh, all these wild mushrooms have a unique flavor. So I started picking and hunting, and I picked morels, chanterelles and occasionally I'd find a matsutake, I'd find the uh, Boletus cascadiensis. Uh, we started coming up with recipes to use these and oh they were so wonderful but I was always out of mushrooms. Seems like before chanterelle season came my chanterelles were all gone and before morel season came they were all gone. And I learned how to cultivate mushrooms and the first thing we cultivated, this is a pink oyster mushroom, Pleurotus dejamore. And uh, that mushroom kind of smells like fish, uh, tastes like seafood. So kind of a tough, chewy mushroom, but it's really easy to grow. It's about like growing dandelions in your lawn. Now this is my favorite mushroom for cultivation. Uh, this is a blue cap oyster mushroom. This is a good mushroom for this time because uh, this mushroom, if it's uh, seethed in water between 160 and 180 degrees, uh, it has an enzyme that uh, we humans use to fight bacteria and viruses. So it can be a medicinal mushroom if it's processed that way. Most people cook it over 180 and that enzyme evaporates off. But, but if you want to use it medicinally, it can be. It's probably my best tasting mushroom because it runs 20% or higher protein. Um, the mycelium in the bag will run 30% protein if you want to use it for cattle or goat feed. I sell mushrooms to restaurants here in Squim, if uh, the restaurant's within one mile of this grow room. I, I cannot supply the mushrooms within one mile of where I'm standing. I, I could grow 10 times as many mushrooms as I do and sell them. These I sell for $20 a kilo, which if you're a metric impaired comes to $9.09 .09 a pound. I really like mushrooms, so I guess that's why I have so many mushrooms. So uh, when I'm over blessed, you're just gonna, you know, it just splashes out on the people around me. These are so easy to grow. If you like mushrooms, there's no reason to ever be out of mushrooms. These grow on wheat straw. Um, I, I buy it for $7.50 a bale, and I can make 20 of these with a uh, two bales of straw. So I've been cultivating oyster mushrooms for about 15 years. I also grow um, shiitake and uh, ling chi. So I eat 50, over 50 species of mushrooms. My favorite mushroom for foraging is matsutake. I think they're flavorful. Uh, they're hard enough to find that it's a real thrill when you do find them. Also, you're likely to come on a patch that has enough quantity to last you for a while and bring them home and process them. My very favorite mushroom for flavor is called the slime foliota. Its scientific name is foliota namico. Uh, it's marketing Japan under the name Namiko, which is Japanese for slimy. It's covered with a semi-transparent layer of gelatinous orange slime that stinks, which makes it kind of a problem for a cultivator to sell fresh. But I have to say, it is my favorite mushroom for flavor, and my favorite way to eat it is to slice it thin, put it on a soup, really, really hot, like boiling hot broth, and put those slices of that foliota on that soup and the amount of time it takes for that soup to cool to where you can eat it is just the amount of time it takes to cook that. Oyster mushrooms are really easy to grow. Uh, these mushrooms are grown on barley straw. You can also use wheat straw, rice straw. What I do with it is I run it through a hammer mill to reduce the volume. I stuff it into a um, basket and and I put that basket it just fits inside a 55 gallon drum so I will put that 
a basket of straw in that drum, submerge it in the water, hold it at 160 to 180 degrees for at least one hour. It kills off the competition to the fungus, but it does not kill the heat-loving bacteria. That thermophilic bacteria is like baby food to the fungus. So by getting a colony of that growing in the straw and then chilling it to where it's still alive but it can't reproduce anymore because it's so cool, the fungus will run through and the first thing it will eat is all those uh, thermophilic bacteria. So this just fits inside a 55 gallon drum. Got one up here. Um, this concrete monolith is, uh, this is a top lit updraft. It's a wood gasifying furnace that I use to uh, pasteurize straw. Uh, the reason I built it was because you get twice as much heat out of wood if you burn it this way by pyrolysis as if you burn it in an open fire. So what this does is it drives all the wood gas off and the flame that comes out of here is so clean you can you can stand in the exhaust and your eyes don't water. It's totally clean burning. It produces about three gallons of charcoal every time I, I burn it and that's the byproduct of, uh, of making mushrooms. So uh, that, that's handy. It's biochar because it's made by pyrolysis and it's a really good uh, thing to use to in your raised beds or your garden to uh, uh, enhance the soil. I wish you'd been here a couple weeks ago. Those plants looked really good before it got cold. <laughs> so we submerge the straw in water and pasteurize it. How long does it take to pasteurize? One to two hours. Why do you do that? If you wet straw, you will grow a fungus. The trick is growing the fungus we want. So in order to do that, we kill all the competing fungus and then massively inoculate it uh, at you know a thousand times the uh, rate of inoculation that it would get in nature. It might get one or two spores landing on a log and eventually it would uh, digest that entire log. Whereas we'll put 10,000 points of inoculation into a basket of straw. I found that blue cap oyster mushroom that I grow on Marrowstone Island on an alder log. So they're in the wild? Oh yeah. Yeah. Cool. In fact, all of these were wild mushrooms that somebody found and cloned. Alright. So if you do find a wild mushroom you'd like me to clone it, uh, I can do that in my lab. The straw is pasteurized. I spread it out on a table. Uh, uh, inoculate it with grain spawn, which is a uh, millet with a fungus growing on it. Uh, I make my own grain spawn here on the mushroom farm. I have a clean room with a laminar flow hood, and I can uh, clone mushrooms and make straw or make grain spawn. Or I can, uh, if I acquire spawn from somebody else, I will, uh, I can expand it out into more spawn. Because mushrooms produce sexually, the offspring that come from the spores won't necessarily perform the way the parents do. So it, it way, makes way more sense for me to, uh, if, if I have, like say, if I, I particularly like this mushroom, um, I would, would tear it open and uh, this, this tissue in here that's below the gills, in my clean room, I would take a little tiny fork that I'd flame sterilized. I'd tease some of that out and put it on agar on, on a petri dish, you know, like this one. This one's empty, but I have some in the lab. That, in, and the fungus grows across the top of them. And then, uh, then we cut up those little pieces of agar and put them in sterilized grain in order to make the grain master. We inoculated these yesterday, and you can't really see any sign you see the little the the grain there right. the little bit of kind of star shape that mycelium trying to grow off into the straw this is the first stage we call this leaping off now 14 days from here on the 24th i expect to be picking mushrooms off that kit that mushroom will fruit 14 days after it's inoculated uh, this one, 16 days, the, the 475, the uh, blue cap oyster mushrooms, uh, takes about 24 days. 
Uh, I can grow shiitake on straw in 45 days. You see this kit, you can still see, you can still see remnants of straw, but the, the fungus is growing to every bit of straw. And that's what happens before it starts fruiting. And then you'll see these little, little guys popping out. These will pin and it doesn't take very long for them to get big enough to pick uh, two days maybe. And they'll, they'll look like this. When the margins begin to undulate, they're ready to pick. Undulate, go up and down. Um, okay. It starts getting see, wavy. <laughs> see, yeah, the, these little ones, the, the margin is a straight line. And these ones that are ready to pick, the margins are going in and out, and up and down. The next thing after they undulate is they spore. And when they sporulate, they uh, millions and millions of spores. So unless you want to clean up this sort of stuff, it's nice to pick them after they undulate before they spore. But it's not necessary. They're still good after they spore. In fact, some of the mushrooms aren't really flavorful until they spore. We're in the clean room. Uh, this is my lab. This is where I uh, clone mushrooms. Um, this is a tiny little two-tine fork. That's my favorite tool for cloning. We would uh, tease a little bit of tissue out of the mushroom and put it on the agar in there and let it grow across until it has colonized this agar like this. And we cut little cubes, little squares of that out and put it in a sterilized grain. This is millet. I like to use millet because the kernels are small. Because they're small, I get more points of inoculation per unit weight than I do with rye or wheat. This is essential to a clean room. You need alcohol that's over 90% alcohol. And try to buy this during the COVID crisis. Um, my sister-in-law works at the co-op where I probably wouldn't be able to get this. So we're in the clean room. This is the work area in my laminar flow hood. When I'm not using it, I keep this cover over the filter. And if you look in here, you see the filter has all these little aluminum channels that point this direction. That's what makes the laminar flow. As the air comes through that filter material, it aims it all this direction so the wind is coming straight toward me. So when I'm working in here, I'll keep what, what I'm working on upwind from me and I'll keep my hands downwind from that. And the, that filter will filter down to 0 0.1 microns. So not even a virus can get through there. So I've got this totally, completely clean wind to work in. So I can open up a, a like a bag of this and pour it into new grain to make an expansion. Or I can clone a mushroom in there, or I can make the, the grain spawn from a, from a petri dish in here. I recommend beginning growers. Don't do this. This, it, takes up a whole room in my house. This equipment is very expensive. Uh, if uh, When I started this, you couldn't buy grain spawn. Now you can buy bags that are four times bigger than this for 20 bucks. These are how I keep my various uh, cultures that I'm growing. And uh, those are ready to expand onto grain. Uh, this is some grain spawn that I did a couple days ago. It hasn't started to uh, grow onto the millet yet. Here's one that I did some time ago and it's trying to fruit inside the bag because they didn't use it in a timely manner. So. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, here's some more spawn that's mature, ready to use. How do you know when it's mature? It turns white. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all white. Huh. Wow. You got all these different. Oh, so this is all grain that's already been inoculated. Yeah. This is a liquid inoculant. I don't normally use that. So this will all eventually become bales that are growing up mushrooms out here in your Yeah, one of, one of these will make 
14 of those little kits or seven of the big ones. So yeah, it expands out quite well. Oh. This is my last crop of pinks. I won't grow them again until next June. I switch to cold temperature mushrooms like this in the winter time. That way I don't have to heat nor cool my grow room. I just leave the window open. Don't make the most common mistake that beginning mushroom cultivators make. Growing shiitake on logs is wonderful if you live in Asia and your grandparents did it, because they know all the secrets. It's really difficult. Uh, I'm sure it could be done here. We have the same climate here as they do in northern Japan, and there's uh, 200,000 farmers growing shiitake on logs there that they import from Siberia. We can grow them here on alder. So this would look like the very best way to do it, but if you don't have that background, there's, there are things they know that we don't know yet. So my advice is grow a mushroom that's really easy to grow. Grow an oyster mushroom, grow it on straw, readily available, cheap, you get really good yields. I'll get 100% efficiency with this mushroom. After you've been growing these easy to grow mushrooms for a while, then try some of the little more difficult ones. Uh, you know, go to a Ganoderma or a shiitake on uh, wood chips or, or uh, sawdust. Uh, then if you can get that down and that's working real well for you, and you want to inoculate some logs, try that. But, but don't, don't start with growing shiitake on logs. That's like, <clears throat> you sign up for a, a class to learn how to dive in, in, in the swimming pool. And you say, for my first dive, I wanna do a double black flip off the high board. Well, you can try it, but probably not gonna have real satisfying results. Start, start with a, you know, a layout dive or jack knife, something easy that you can get well, and then go to the next harder one. And that, that's what I advise for people who are trying to grow mushrooms. So eventually, after I've grown mushrooms, uh, something else will start eating the mushrooms. This is green crud on here, uh, and it's digesting the mushroom now. You would think that these are worthless at this point. However, I sell these to worm growers for a buck for the big ones and 50 cents for the little ones. Uh, they, they would buy them faster than I produce them. Uh, this is like a favorite bedding and food for red wiggler worms. So, I was growing red wiggler worms accidentally for years before I started growing them on purpose because when I throw these mushroom kits out like this, the worms would find them. And eventually my wife would say, oh, you gotta get rid of those. Uh, neighbors don't know they're not full of pampers. You know, it just looks like you got a pile of garbage in the backyard. So I go throw them in the truck and there'd be a layer this deep of uh, worm castings. And these red wiggler worms trying to get out of the, out of the, uh, the sunlight. And a friend of mine who was a gardener says, oh, those are worth a lot of money. And I go, ah, worms aren't worth a little money. But it turns out they are. I've sold over 100,000 of them off of this farm. That's uh, over 4,000. I think I'm at about $4,200 in uh, worm sales. So they are quite valuable. Uh, if you want more information about our mushroom farm, our website is deetsfarm.com. That's spelled D-I-E-T-Z, farm.com.